because the inputs that underpin historical advertising infrastructures are going away. And so Meta et al are having to do damage control and they're having to do damage control because of a choice they did not have any agency in making. Hey gang, it's Monday, June 6th. Evelyn and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Marketing Architects. I'm Marcus. Today I'm joined by one of our analysts covering digital advertising and media, Miss Evelyn Mitchell. Hey there, Marcus. Glad to be here. Happy Monday. Hello. Same to you. Thanks for hanging out. Today's fact. Well, what exactly is the Airbnb logo? Evelyn, do you know this one? I feel like I should, but I don't. You should. I've been thinking this for a while. You really should know this information. (laughs) Get together. Well, first of all, why is it called Airbnb? Well, to make rent, two of the founders loaned out rooms in their San Francisco apartment to visiting designers from the International Design Conference after hotels in the area were booked up. The two called their new endeavor Air Bed and Breakfast, a reference to the air mattresses the guests were staying on. This was noted by the Boston Globe. So that's why they're called Airbnb. Why the logo? So if you can picture the logo, it's like a pink squiggly thing. And it's for a number of reasons. Number one, it's supposed to represent people. So the middle part of it is supposed to be like a head and then kind of goes down, up and around. It's like an upside down heart. So it goes down, up and around on both sides. That's supposed to be the arms. So it's supposed to be like a person. Also, secondly, places. The middle part, which is the head, is also the similar shape as the uh, location logo that you see uh, when you want to mark somewhere on the map. Also, the third reason is for love. It's an upside down heart. And then finally, it's also an A to stand for Airbnb. That's why the, uh, the logo looks like a bit like a paperclip that's been mangled. But wow, well, they yeah. have a lot of reasons behind their logo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, Maybe too many. Anyway, today's real topic, Apple's app tracking transparency's one year anniversary. So Evelyn, you'd reminded me of this birthday that app tracking transparency has just had. And on April 26th, Apple's app tracking transparency or ATT as we'll refer to it going forwards, I'm sure. Update for iOS became one years old. ATT being Apple's opt-in privacy framework that requires all iOS apps to ask users for permission to share their data. This came alongside the iOS 14.5 update. The announcement was big news and for good reason, having a profound impact on the advertising space and how companies now do business. Evelyn, at the the marking of the one year anniversary, what were just kind of your initial reactions having been one year already? I feel the same way about being one year into ATT as I do about being one year out from my wedding day, which is to say I am amazed at how quickly we arrived at this milestone and I am I'm anxious to see how it, how things unfold because we still have a lot of work ahead of us here yes indeed let's talk about where we are at the moment and later i'm going to ask you a bit about yeah where where we're headed with this and some of the questions you have but there's some data from apps flyer trying to figure out us opt-in and adoption rates for app tracking transparency Uh, and ios 14.5 they also track so the end of december last year 89 percent of people had uh, opted in uh, to or updated uh, to, so they now have iOS 14.5, 89% of, of folks with an iOS device. People, in terms of people who had opted in to ATT though, that was uh, a fair amount lower, 37%. Uh, 37% had opted into ATT. What, what do you make of that number, Evelyn? Because it, it seemed as though more, that seems higher than people were, were expecting people to opt into to add tracking. A lot of projections were incredibly low, single digits or, or going up to about 20, 25%. What do you make of the 37% opt-in for ATT at the end of last year? A lot of consumers don't really have the full understanding of what's going on with their data in mobile advertising. And that's part of the problem, right? It's really hard to get a really detailed account of not only what data is being collected and by which apps, but then where it goes from there. And a lot of players in the digital advertising space don't really keep 
very good track of that. So it's hard to, even if you were to request that information as a consumer, you might get the response, we don't know. Like it's impossible mm -hmm. to tell. Mm -hmm. That being said, a lot of consumers aren't interested and they just want to get the annoying prompt off their screen yeah. and they don't care either way. So allow is fewer words than ask app not to track. There are certainly some consumers that would say ask app not to track. What does that mean? <laughs> like mm -hmm. I have follow up questions. Yeah. So I think it I mean, it makes sense that a higher percentage of consumers are OK with being tracked. But I don't think the discussion is over. You know, we still have some like Google, for example, is deprecating the Google ad ID on Android phones in the future. So there will be more education that happens, consumer facing education that happens about what's going on with data practices and advertising in the mobile landscape. So we'll have to see kind of how things level out in the future, too, because Apple will probably also roll out more privacy changes with iOS updates in the future. So mm -hmm. this data says 37 percent of people opted in in the States to Apple's app tracking transparency but to your point what does opted in mean does it mean clicked to get rid of does it mean kind of understood fully understood there was an interesting uh, article written by daniel konstantinovich who's one of the analysts here at uh, insider intelligence and he was writing that the sooner the prompt the better those that were shown the tracking prompt on first launch of an app were 30 percent three zero more likely to consent compared with those who received it later on and I imagine Evelyn, a lot of those people are like, it pops up and I need to get rid of this thing to get into the app. So they do. Who are the biggest winners and losers so far? Who are some of the names that come to mind when you think of people who are benefiting from this and, and not so much? It depends on whose perspective you're taking, I think. <laughs> yeah. One of the biggest winners, just about any way you cut it, is Apple itself. How big of a and winner are they? It depends on how you look at it. I, I, I... One of the biggest indicators to me has been the way that they've leaned into the optics of this decision f on the consumer facing front. You know, they've put out a couple of really satirical and engaging commercials that get a lot of coverage in the press as well in, in trades where they're kind of exploring the maybe some more invasive data collection practices that are happening behind the scenes of advertising and they are positioning this privacy debate as if it's advertisers versus you know consumers good and it behooves them to cater to consumers because their device sales and their services that are delivered through those devices are their bread and butter mm -hmm. you know apple did get a boost in page search activity in its app store as a result of ATT. Um, and that's one of the more quantifiable ways that ATT has benefited Apple. Mm -hmm. But Apple is not very popular among advertisers and app developers right now, if it ever was. Yeah. That's because advertising is not Apple's bread and butter the way that it is with, say, Meta or Google. So it behooves them to kind of cater more to consumers and to harness the conversation in a way that makes them look good. And I think they've done a really effective job at that. Speaking of, yeah, quantifiable, yeah, exactly that. Daniel was also noting that Apple benefited greatly from AT&T by the change greatly increasing the value of first party data and caused Apple's store search ad revenue to grow over 230%, 230% uh, last year to uh, nearly $4 billion in services, which includes advertising, now one of the fastest growing categories at the company. Any other obvious winners come to mind? Not so much. I think Google, I've, I view them as another winner, at least in terms of their primary source of revenue, their primary audience, advertisers, because yep. Google has now gotten to kind of be the hero for advertisers. They've said, you know, listen, in the name of privacy, we're getting rid of the Google ad ID on Android devices, but we'll give you plenty of time to figure figure out some satisfactory alternatives. We'll, we'll put in the legwork, we'll facilitate discussions and trials and provide guidance and, and all of that. So so they they get to be the hero for mm -hmm. advertisers. And it also bears mentioning that getting rid of the Google ad ID further bolsters Google's dominance in the mobile advertising landscape because it has just a monumental amount of consumer data to work with. Yeah. So yeah, Google is another winner, I'd say. Some of the biggest losers so far. Biggest losers. I think many social media platforms are the loudest and I think mm. many of them, Meta in particular, want to be acknowledged as the biggest losers. 
and AT&T does present very real issues for them. We probably would not be having this discussion were that not the case, Mm -hmm. because the inputs that underpin historical advertising infrastructures are going away. And so Meta et al are having to do damage control and they're having to do damage control because of a choice they did not have any agency in making. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, advertisers also kind of fit that description, right? They're having to put resources into alternatives to processes they may have preferred to keep if they had a choice. But the way I view it, we're not we're not done here, right? There are some solid winners, I think, at this point. But anyone that's a quote unquote loser, I think that's a temporary status because we still we're we're still moving forward. Advertising is not going away. And so, you know, we'll pick up the pieces, we'll figure out alternatives, and then new winners will emerge. And if you decide you are a loser, then, that's that is a decision that you've made at this point because yeah. we're not done yet. Yeah, winners and losers. I should have said in the last twelve months, right? Because things <laughs> are things are going to be moving quite quite quickly. Yeah, Meta. They say they're expecting to lose ten billion dollars this year because of ATT. And then you mentioned et al. Data management company Lotomy estimates that ATT's changes could reduce revenues for Twitter, Snap, Meta, and YouTube speaking of Google and YouTube, by a collective $16 billion. So Meta says $10 billion for them, but collectively $16 billion potentially could be wiped, according to Lotomy. Speaking about Meta being louder than others about what's going on here and about how they might be losing out, Meta has called out app tracking transparency as anti-competitive, writes insider intelligence analyst we mentioned earlier, Daniel Konstantinovich. He notes that Meta went after Apple for its ATT policy and other restrictions, which it called self-serving, in quotes, and a request for comment with the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, the NTIA, about the state of competition in the mobile app industry. Evelyn, what do you make of Meta calling ATT anti-competitive? I think coming from anyone else, it's a reasonable (laughs) interpretation. I I mean, coming from Meta, it's it's still a reasonable interpretation because Apple has benefited from the change in quantifiable and not so quantifiable ways, as we've discussed. And a lot of players in the mobile advertising industry are scrambling and there are resources that are having to be diverted to figuring out what the heck is going on and what to do next. But you know, Meta has a lot to work with still, you know, like from a targeting perspective, Meta has ample amounts of first party data to draw from their portfolio of apps where users are logged in in those environments. So, you know, while their targeting capabilities might have been stronger when they could incorporate third party signals, they still are in a better position than a lot of their their competitors. And I think they're trying to kind of take on a position of, you know, we're, we're advocating for the good of the market. But it just feels a little bit odd to me because Meta is also such a dominant force in the mobile and broader digital advertising space um, and are the subject of anti-competitive kind of scrutiny themselves. So mm-hmm. it just feels a little bit odd to me. Yeah, we should note that I just mentioned that Meta said they expect to lose $10 billion this year because of ATT. Sounds like a lot of money, uh, but last year they made $115 billion. So that would be about 9% of the revenue that they made they're expecting to lose because of ATT this year. It's not nothing, but at the same time, if you make $115 billion, you're not going to make uh, that extra 10. It, it's also kind of, in some respects, not much. <laughs> we talked about the the winners, the losers, particularly in the last 12 months or so. What are you paying closest attention to going forward with regards to ATT? I'm paying attention to a couple of interesting developments in targeting and measurement. Targeting front, I find contextual solutions really interesting. And particularly in the app space, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on. So I'm excited to see where that goes and what adoption is like and where we are a year from now when, you know, advertisers have really gotten into these new solutions and and they evolve to adapt to the needs of advertisers as they arise. And then on the measurement front, I'm really interested to see how measurement signals 
have been fractured in the wake of ETT, and and there are additional layers of of processing and deduplication that have to happen to all of these measurement signals. So, I'm interested to see where things go because we're kind of we're kind of rebuilding a lot of the foundations of mobile advertising, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in that, even though it's it's scary and and hectic right yeah. now. Yeah. So. Well, that's it for the lead. It's time now for the half time report. Evelyn, one takeaway from you, please, from the first half. All right. So app tracking transparency, ATT, has upended the mobile and app advertising landscape, and the industry has regained its footing, but things are still pretty shaky as targeting and measurement capabilities kind of catch up to where we are. And one big thing I'd like to mention is that we aren't likely to stumble as badly when Google gets rid of the Google Ad ID next year. So that's a kind of a positive note to end on that's what we've got time for for the lead uh, before the ad break and in other news i have two things i want to tell you folks uh, one i'm on twitter so follow me at just marcus underscore btn for all behind the numbers updates what a time to get into twitter marcus. i know i timed it well i don't know what i was thinking <laughs> and the second thing i have for you is time now for our surprise question giveaway oh no oh. way Oh, I'm so coming. excited to be a not part you, of this. Not you, Evelyn. <laughs> not you. Uh, sorry, Evelyn really wants the, the prize, which is a mug. So I'm going to read out a question in a second. All you have to do is email the... Not you, Evelyn. Or everybody <laughs> not called Evelyn, who's on the show currently, <laughs> has to do is email the correct answer to podcast at emarketer.com and send us a screenshot of your review of this podcast and you will win a free mug. So correct answer to the question plus a review a good one, please. Equals a free mug. So the question is, what is the most... Evelyn, if you know this off the top of your head, then maybe we can get Stuart to send you one. Um, what is the most viewed video on YouTube? Let's say as of April 2022. It doesn't really matter as of when, because as of now. But let's say as of April 2022. But what's the most viewed video on YouTube? It's not close. I don't know off the top of my head. Oh, well, then no mug for Evelyn. I know so that close. Gangnam Style is up there. Is or it? At least it was at some point. Should it be? <laughs> oh, it's not that. That's a fair guess, though. But if you do know the right answer, send them in to uh, podcast.emarketer.com with a screenshot of your review. And I should make sure I say this because I didn't say this last time. If you're the first person to send that in, then you win. You don't just, I can't give mug mugs to everybody, okay? We're a podcast for crying out loud. So first one to send in, but there are very few people will send something in. So you have a massive chance if you send in an answer and a review. That's all we've got time for. Time now for in other news, but first quick word from our sponsor, Marketing Architects. TV advertising is a powerful channel for growth, but traditional process for launching TV campaigns is, is expensive and complex. That's why Marketing Architects changed it. With all-inclusive TV advertising, they invest their own money, that's right, their own money, to produce, analyze, and optimize your campaign. All you pay for is media, setting you up for rapid growth at an extreme cost advantage. This approach is so revolutionary, they wrote a book about it. You want that book? Go to marketingarchitects.com slash book to get your free copy today. Folks, we're back today. Another news. TikTok adds third-party cookies to its Pixel. And what's the most important thing to note this year when it comes to display advertising? Story one. TikTok adds third-party cookies to its Pixel and tries to eat Facebook's lunch, writes James Hersher of Ad Exchanger. He notes that TikTok just made it possible to add first-party cookies to its site conversion pixel so advertisers can track site activity and attribute ads across browsers. They also require that advertisers collect and pass third-party cookies to TikTok. Facebook started offering businesses a first-party cookie option with the Facebook pixel in late 2019, Mr. Hershen notes. Um, but Evelyn, the impact of this news will be blank short-lived mm. to be honest i'm a little confused by this move by tiktok it's been courting advertisers pretty aggressively recently you know rolling out new products and tools and tech enhancements and in all likelihood 
adding third party cookies to its pixel will attract more advertisers, but third party cookies are on their way out and they're already out of play on Safari, which is a major uh, mobile browser. So if we've learned anything from the fallout from ATT, it's that advertisers don't like losing what they have access to if there isn't already a robust proven alternative in place. So whatever performance boost advertisers see from from this change, I really hope TikTok is already working on ways to maintain it once third party cookies are no more. Yeah. Who does like that? You know, going backwards, like we used to give you this and now you have less. Are you going to be okay with that? Yeah, it'll be fine. Story two. Evelyn, your new US display ad spending 2022 report just came out and notes that display will account for well over half of all US digital ad spending this year. Display counting for well over half of digital ad spending this year as it cruises towards the 60% mark. Video, you also know, accounts for 53% of display, 57% in four years time. But the biggest takeaway for you from your recent report was blank. Don't let nascent technology like the metaverse distract you from enhancing your display strategy today. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Talk to there's, me. Yeah. There's a lot of buzz about the metaverse and it does have massive potential, but there are a lot of other trends in display right now, like TikTok, that are of more com- immediate importance to brands. And if you're an advertiser that's that's putting more effort into being one of the early movers in the metaverse, just make sure you aren't dropping the ball on building or maintaining your brand between now and whenever the metaverse materializes in, in its full glory, if it ever does. In a hundred years or so, yeah. Exactly. Uh, if you're a pro subscriber, go to insiderintelligence.com to get access to the full report. US display ad spending 2022 videos in the driver's seat. Evelyn writes, but now what? That's what we've got time for for this episode. Thank you, Evelyn, for hanging out. Thanks, Marcus. Thank had you. a great time. Amazing. Oh. Me too. Thanks to Victoria who edits the show and thanks to everyone else for listening in. We'll see you tomorrow for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listening New Marketer podcast made possible by Marketing Architects. Send in those answers, win that free mug. <laughs>